Proper variant, this is Victoria 3's dev during number 39. Today we have shipping lanes and it is a very interesting topic. The mechanic as proposed or as shown here by Kaiser Johan, you may know Kaiser Johan from the EU4 dev clashes and from not being that Johan but the other Johan, they're, they're Swedish, they have infinite Johans. Uh, this mechanic seems to be quite neat. It seems to be quite well endeavored and more importantly I think it does move Victoria as a franchise significantly forward because in Victoria 2 again, and we've talked about this so often, in Victoria 2 this was not a thing. <laughs> None of these mechanics played a role. There was no option for this. This basically did nothing. Yes, you could blockade cords, uh, blockade ports, but they didn't work in any way the way these shipping lanes appear to be working. I still have criticisms and they fundamentally build up on the thing that we talked about when it came to navies and navy dev diaries, which was basically does distance play a role for navies and navy engagements, navy availability, because the way it seems is that since it doesn't play a role, the system works, but if it did, the system wouldn't. Now, let's take a look at the dev there and I will explain my hopes and my concerns. I am Johan, no, the other Johan, a tech lead on Victoria 3, and today I will be talking about shipping lanes. It is an interesting addition to maritime empires in that there is now a cost to overseas possessions, and sending a military expedition halfway across the globe is no longer as straightforward as in some older Paradox titles. This is pretty good. Um, so we talked about this when it comes to barracks. The barracks have a military unit assigned. These military units go somewhere on deployment. Let's say in South Africa, they're fighting the Boer Wars and they must be supplied via the barrack building. But the barrack building can be found in England, meaning that all of a sudden you must establish a supply lane. If there were local troops, which is something, historically speaking, that especially Great Britain, you know, definitely pushed a lot, they wanted this. Um, if you have local troops and they're locally ran, locally maintained, you don't need these supply lines. The Great British Empire had a big, big push throughout the 19th century to state Canada, please, South Africa, please, uh, uh, even India, quite frankly, where they then took the control of, of, uh, over after the East Indian Company failed. We're looking at Oceania, for example. They demanded that these colonies at some certain point were going on to form their own forces to protect themselves and maybe even to have other engagements going forward from there. This in itself is a really good dynamic that is established because you need to carry now the weight of the military expeditions that previously outside of Hearts of Iron was not the case. This was not being done anywhere. It was always a local self-supply. We're looking now at a working system, at least you know when it comes to the theory here, that gives us a completely differently a different angle. I like this a lot. This is very very good. Now but the nature of the convoys is something that we may have to talk about. But first we have to talk about convoys, which are an essential part in maintaining shipping lanes. They are produced from ports, a government building which requires clippers or their era equivalent and possibly other goods. Each country has a set number of required convoys and not having enough will incur penalties on all shipping lanes. Take note of this. If you do not have enough convoys, all of your shipping lanes will suffer. We do know that if an enemy were to raid your shipping lanes in a specific node, the shipping lanes that are in that node suffer more than the entire network, but the entire network will still suffer. This in itself seems counterintuitive. If I sh sink ships in, you know, I don't know, uh, close to South Africa, why would, would my shipping lanes with Canada actually take damage? The idea is that this is this sort of mass that symbolizes and that shows the entire aggregate of your shipping industry within your empire, right? And this shipping industry would have to redistribute if a certain area was undervalued. We talked about this in the past as well, how it would be nice if I could give preferences to certain shipping nodes, but that doesn't seem to be in. The fact that I can't say, I don't know, getting the food to my country so that my people don't starve is more important than the luxury furniture, it's kind of odd, but it makes sense once we get to what gets the main bulk of complaints in this dev diary from me anyway. And again, this dev diary in itself is a very stable mechanic if something isn't in that I wish was in. Now, uh, so basically this is how it is. Each country has a set number of required convoys and not having enough will incur penalties. This may, for example, occur due to an overstretched colonial empire or hostile convoy raiders. Makes sense. Ports also fulfill an important role in connecting your overseas territories, but more on that later. Ah, I told you, the Clipper Factory was a good investment. This is how you know that Kaiser Johan did definitely play Victoria 2, because that is what capitalists in Victoria 2 would build without fail. Um, here we have a port building in East Anglia. You can see there are five levels. There are 25k employed, meaning 5k per level. You pay 5.51k per uh, week, I think, per month. I think it's per, per week, right? Or per... F 
four weeks. Either way, you pay this sum. I forgot in how they calculate. Did they ever say that? Oh, it's the weekly balance. Right, okay, I had a lapse of judgment there. Um, this production method is interesting to me. I don't know exactly what it means, but this production method implies that different things can be done. Maybe this is exclusively, you know, to change your input so that instead of the clippers, you would have steamboats, that sort of stuff. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, also important to know, uh, to point out that you can only have six layers of ports here in East Anglia. Very reminiscent of Victoria 2, for example, as well. But also making it so that you sometimes might have to diversify as far as your empire is concerned. It also actually makes me think. Of course, we have this notion where trade routes are always established between the two shortest route available ports meaning if east anglia is the shortest available port it will pick that if it's not then it might pick somerset and so on what i'm thinking about is this implies that ah but it's not directly connected see i'm, I'm mostly thinking about this the port only seems to serve as a spot where it connects the trade route and other than that it produces convoys and these convoys go into this generalized system i was hoping that if you had six layers of ports you may only be able to have 6 or 12 trade routes, whatever is an adequate number, through this building. Meaning, even if it was the shortest route, it can't be, once it is maxed out in its trade route, supply in that state. But I don't think that's how it works. I'm pretty sure that since convoys are generalists, they apply to every single trade route equally, no matter where they are produced. For example, if I had the... Yeah, I don't know. I don't think that is how it works. If I had, a, port, you know, all of my ports in Scotland, they produce a million convoys, but then the closest ports are in, for example, East Anglia, so then I'm pretty sure that it's all going to come out there. Yeah, mostly, uh, that would be cool if it would diversify your port usage based on the port level. Maybe it does that. Honestly, they haven't said anything about that, but that would be very cool. Uh, you can see they're using Clippers wages to create 1,000 convoys and 25 urbanization. Now, shipping lanes, uh, lanes represent port-to-port -port connections and are established for three different reasons. Trade routes, supply routes for generals, and port connections to link states in a market. None of those are surprises. We've talked about all of these in the past. Very, very cool, nonetheless, of course, to see that generals and overseas links must be connected now. Each shipping lane must have its own origin and destination port. Once established, it will span across a number of sea nodes and have its own individual cost and convoys, which adds up to the country's total convoy requirement. So, yeah, basically, the shortest uh, paths generate the convoy requirement for the trade route, and then all of the trade routes get, uh, you know, uh, uh, added to one another, and you end up with the actual requirement that you need to fulfill by producing convoys within your port. Makes sense. Again, this is for internal and for external trade and transport. It also tracks its own effectiveness score, which is based on the overall supply network strength, more on that later, and may be reduced by any local convoy damage done along the route. So this is, again, if your convoy uh, network strength goes down, then your effectiveness suffers, and if you get raided in this particular area, then it also suffers. And this is important, because and they did respond to this in the uh, dev diary responses for the last dev diary, but basically trade route competitiveness is what determines if, let's say, there are 80 goods of some sort, and or 80 units, and you are buying as much as you can from that via a trade route, but there are trade routes that demand a total of 100 of that good. Let's just assume this. I'm not sure whether this is exactly how it works, but this is how it seems to be after their explanations. If your competitiveness is low, you will get a smaller share of those 80 units. If your competitiveness is high, you will get a larger share, a share to fa satisfy your total trade route. So basically, you want to keep your uh, co competitiveness up so that you have bulk transport in there, otherwise you will suffer. While India provides Great Britain numerous benefits, uh, benefits such as raw materials and population, it is clear that the crown jewel of the British Empire is by no means cheap. A massive civilian and military naval industry is required to maintain it and keep it safe, and thus it is by no means obvious whether such overseas possessions are always worth it. Note that UI and values are very much work in progress. Right, um, when I saw this, I have to tell you, this UI is very... I hate this UI. <laughs> uh, because basically, like, there's no... I don't know, these, this is like just a long list and nobody's ever going to look at this and actually read it all. But it is very much work in progress, so let's not dwell on it too much. Let's see. 
We are getting uh, hardwood from the Swedish and Russian markets. We are getting iron from Sweden, fruit from the Hawaiian market, and then we have overseas port connections to Madras, which I believe to be India, to Quebec, which is of course the connection to North America, British Guatemala, which is Central America, and then we, well, in this case it's just Belize, I believe, right? And then we have Mesquitia. Honestly, I don't know what that is, please point it out in the comments, but these are the internal supply lanes. Currently, British Guatemala needs zero convoys. Or maybe they just didn't get any assigned. Interesting that they straight up get zero. Well, anyway, we talked about the pitfalls of this in particular. The pitfalls of, for example, say Quebec being unable to supply Canada and Canada all of a sudden starving despite... For example, you know, uh, Ontario producing a boatload of grain, but they can't use it because there is no submarket capital. Submarket capitals do not appear to be viable. Let's just make that clear. Meaning, these actual transport directions and routes become ever more important. This is why I'm saying I have complaints about the system. But all in all, if you think about it and how it might play out, it seems very, very good. Because yes, okay, you can have this weird situation where during a war Canada all of a sudden starves despite Canada having a good local supply of food. But the truth is, if you as a player are confronted with the question of slightly higher prices for grain throughout your empire, something like that, right? Or Canada as a whole starving, you might be willing to move towards peace much more quickly. Again, this is not a reflection of reality. In reality, Canada would largely attempt to self-supply, maybe purchase from the United States of America. But the gameplay effect that this seems to be suggesting here makes a lot of sense. Now, the other criticism that I do have, we are going to see, I think, when it comes to trade routes. Trade routes between two markets which do not share a common land border. This sounds like whenever you have a land border, the trade will always be conducted by trade, uh, by, by land, I mean. This was a question that I had last Def Diary. Must be done overseas and will necessitate a shipping lane. Land adjacency is determined from where two market capitals are located, right? Yeah, it does sound like the Prussian market would always purchase goods from Russia via the land route, which isn't necessarily true, but at the very least it marks you down as, okay, that's how it works. The convoy cost is influenced by the number of C-notes. Quantity of goods, that is very important, wasn't always the case. In the early screenshot, it was not at all touched by the quantity of goods and any good specific modifiers, if any. This is cool. If you are having certain goods that are very heavy, that are difficult to transport, all that sort of stuff, you will have trouble bringing them from A to B. Meaning, you might want to produce them in B. This is good. This is a really, really good change. Really solid. I'm really, really happy with what they're doing there. The effectiveness affects the trade route competitiveness and by extension the quantity of goods shipped. That makes perfect sense. It will use the two closest ports in the respective market capitals region. If either country lacks ports, no overseas trade route can be established. See, this does make me think you could probably make it so that sometimes Essex, you know, just doesn't have enough ports. But it does open up the following question. It opens up the shortest port connection that is physically possible. In House of Iron 4, you're looking at a situation where, for example, if there is trade route raiding going on, and to be fair, I do want to stress this as well, Hearts of Iron 4 is a war game, but if you are facing this situation, Hearts of Iron 4 says you can mark certain sea zones as do not ship through here because it will be dangerous there, don't do it. This is pretty good because it makes it so that you still have this automatic calculation of the best trade route, but the player can say not here, not here, not here. If we take this example though for Victoria 3, where so far it has been confirmed, at least from as far as I know, that you can't change any anything manually when it comes to the trade route generation, we're looking at a situation where all of a sudden, if I am, for example, Great Britain, and I am at war with Italy, and I am shipping to Australia through the Suez Canal, let's say, for some miraculous reason, I am unable to protect my shipping close to Italy. I don't know. The Royal Navy screwed up. If I can't do that, this means that my convoys, no matter what, will go through there. What is the upside of this? The upside is that the player will care. This creates a mechanic where the player will say, I will have to act. I must generate a navy. I must bring my navy there. I must fight them. I, I must fend them off. Or maybe I want to end the war early so that Italy stops raiding my convoys there. 
This in itself is good, because it is engaging. The alternative, as far as I've thought it through, is, for example, where it's just, oh, Italy's raiding me, I'm gonna move my trade over there. Italy says, okay, that's fine, I'll move my raiding over there. Then you say, oh, Italy's raiding here, well, I'll be moving my trade over there. It's finicky, right? This could very quickly get finicky, and to be fair, Hearts of Iron 4, to a degree, on this level is finicky. But giving us no option is something that is difficult. What it does do is work. And I will always be positive towards working system. This is clearly a system that gets player responses when necessary. But I will tell you, I do think that primarily what I, what my issue with this system is, that should at any given point, and we have talked about this, we have hypothesized about this, and we were uncertain whether there is any sort of distance limit that navies can travel. It was never mentioned, it was never brought up. It just means that it takes more time, right, to get there. But if there is no limitation... This means that your shortest trade route sort of thing is basically something that can be there. Once you inter uh, introduce a limitation in naval range, you're looking at a situation where you might have a trade route that is the shortest line, but not for the navy that you are choosing. Because that navy can't access it via coaling stations in certain areas. Whereas a longer trade route could be accessible by your navy. Let's say, for example, you can use the Suez Canal, but you have no holdings in the Mediterranean, in the Red Sea, and so on. On the other hand, you do have holdings in Africa along the coast. Meaning shipping there is something you could do and reasonably protect because you have military recalling stations. Um... This entire system, where distance for military naval crafts would work, can't work in this system as far as I understand it, or at least it seems very counterintuitive. But what this basically tells me is that we will not have naval distance limits. At least that is how I understand it, because if it chooses a route, even if it is the shortest, but it is a path where you do not have any naval bases, with a distance modifier, you couldn't protect your own shipping. And that obviously doesn't make any sense. So I have to assume that there is no limit, which is saddening me, but also which is what enables this system. So tangent, bringing it to an end. Ultimately, this system seems to work. Is it entirely realistic? Certainly not. It, you know, is something where maybe under wartime you would have different, more very specific sections that you would decide on doing that you can't do here because the trade-offs are determined automatically. But the system forces you to act nonetheless. And that is good. Forcing players to actually respond to something is very important. There's the uh, very, uh, I think, legendary at this point, I think, uh, World of Warcraft boss design formula where one of the key points that must be considered for a mechanic is does the player care and can the player respond properly to it? And this is a big thing here. You will care, let me tell you. When, you know, the effectiveness goes down, when Canada is starving and so on, you will start to care and then you can choose to, you know, do something about it if you have a navy. So, basically... I criticize this on the notion of I would like Navy on a military level to have a bigger reach issue because reach is a big, big topic in this era. While at the same time, without the reach, this system works perfectly fine. So basically, good system as it is. Um, right. Supply routes are required when a general is sent to a front that is not reachable by land. It will use a friendly port connected by land to the general's headquarters and trace to the closest friendly port reachable from the front. Uh, that does seem, yeah, okay, that does seem like the general will start also from allied ports, if there are allied ports that are connected to your capital, or well, to their uh, barracks, yeah, so to their headquarters. And this means that ports probably do not have an integrated limit to what can pass them. Like, for example, you know, with trade centers, as we saw them in the last dev diary, there could theoretically be a limit, oh, the infrastructure doesn't permit us to do more here, meaning we'll open trade centers in a port that is further, but actually is workable. I don't think that this is done here or considered for the general. It doesn't sound like it either way. The convoy cost is based on the number of sea nodes, battalions supplied, and any general trades. Low effectiveness reduces supply status of the general and his troops. If a front is landlocked, no generals can be sent there. Makes perfect sense. Supplying troops over great distances is quite an enterprise. Rather than sending an expeditionary force from England all the way around the Cape to reach India, perhaps Britain should consider building a standing army using either colonial setters, as settlers or locals. That is exactly what they did. That is exactly what they motivated everybody to. Love Kaiser Johan. Good stuff. Lastly, port connections are a bit more complicated. In order for a state to access the goods within the market, it needs to be able to trace a, ba a path back to the market capital. 
This must be done for every state within the market, including foreign ones. Rather than a single state having its own shipping lane, a group of adjacent overseas states can form a cluster with a single exit port to the market capital, such as Bombay in the case of British India. I hate this so much. Like, <laughs> listen, this makes perfect sense. This isn't news. We know this. We know this from the Canada AR, from previous uh, uh, dev diaries and so on. But my god, they form a cluster, right, to connect fully, to have the infrastructure. Please give me market subcapitals. Again, much more complex from what I have been told and I think what they've stated publicly as well. But I gotta tell you, reading this, I just wish it weren't so. I wish that this cluster thinking was also integrated should the port actually fail. Uh, either way, if the connection is severed from either end, then the overseas states cannot access the market and thus form its own isolated enclave. What is this? I'm so confused. They don't mean a submarket, do they? I don't... No, 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 they can't because they've explained to me why they do not work that in as of right now. But man, an isolated enclave, if they could trade internally, wouldn't it be great? Anyway, likewise, if the shipping lane effectiveness is strained, it will lower the accessibility of goods to and from the overseas market. Reflect back on previous dev diaries and consider the cascading, uh, cascading consequences that were to occur if a maritime empire reliant on its overseas possessions were to suddenly lose control of its shipping lanes. This is why, despite the Canada effect, I'm not too eager to say this is bad. The effect that you want to have gameplay-wise, right? is basically you as a player seeing, oh look at that, my supply chains are screwed, either I can repair them by protecting it with my navy, or I should probably leave the war. This is an effect that you want, as a, as a game designer I reckon, but also as a player, because otherwise how do you force a player into doing anything if India just starts supplying itself and just it just works, right? This is why I will fundamentally say I find it odd that the market capitals, you know, like that, that Canada will starve, that India might starve if they get disconnected from London, from the British capital. But ultimately, the way I see it is that the effect that you get out of this is actually glorious. It's actually grand. So, you know what, I'm withdrawing most of my criticism when it comes to this. I hope that the system simply works and that the players will be forced to respond because this will be what will make warfare interesting. Your systems getting sabotaged and you deciding whether you can fix it or whether you should rather leave this war before your people get uppity worldwide. Cool stuff, cool stuff. Again, the caveat here really is that Victoria 2 had literally none of this. It's the market owner which must establish and pay for the port connections to all overseas market states. To somewhat compensate for this, its subjects must share a portion of their convoys with their overlord. We were asking about this as well in one of the previous dev diaries anyway. Uh, so the subject pitches in basically. Interesting. Subjects are still required to pay for their own trade and supply routes, uh, supply routes however. So you're a subject, you create trade, you have to run that entirely on your own. Shipping lanes, if you have some overseas stuff, you run that entirely on your own. If you are undersupplied because your liege can't keep up the market supply to you, you can try to help with that by creating more convoys, which then 50% of them go to your liege. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Is it the perfect system? I mean, probably the best that can be worked in, but theoretically, no, there are better systems. But this is a system that appears to be working and that is fulfilling all of the things that I was asking for when it comes to the topic of responsiveness. The convoy cost of a port connection is influenced by the number of sea nodes and the overseas infrastructure usage. By extracting your raw materials from overseas colonial plantations and mines, while the high infrastructure manu manufacturing industries produce finished goods are located near the market capital, you can keep your port connection costs down, though at the expense of the development and wealth of your colonies. This is the key to all of this. This is why nobody in my opinion, can be mad about any of the other things that might give you a headache, that might keep you up at night. Because, ultimately, the effect here is that supply from India to Britain is very important, very vital and very interesting, but you don't actually want to build up India or you must connect them to a market capital that all of a sudden must carry up a lot more when it comes to the infrastructure usage, ultimately leading to the classic and very you know, symptomatic or symptom situation of imperialism in this period in the 19th and 20th century of making it so that you are exploiting their resources, bringing them home and work them there. This 
is literally how you get this sort of development naturally without forcing it. I'm a huge, huge fan of this. I can't overstate this. The ultimate effect of this system with any complaint about naval reach, about naval convoy generation, about uh, trade route cho uh, choosing and so on and where they uh, go along, that sort of stuff. All of that aside, or rather, all of that can stand back because this actually creates a gameplay loop that makes sense. Big fan of this. Connecting India to the British market means it has to go all the way around the Cape to reach the British Isles, which significantly impacts cost. But what if Britain somehow managed to discover a shortcut? Of course, if you can cut this down, you will have to cut down on convoys, meaning, I mean, first of all, your ports and your clipper industries may suffer. But other than that, you're looking at a much, much easier way of transporting goods, making them cheaper. And lastly, when combining all the shipping lanes of a country, we get it over get its overall supply network. As outlined earlier on, we derive its strength score from the cost of all individual shipping lanes compared to the country's total supply. Makes sense. And this is it. And next week, Daniel will be back to tell us about how the Opium Wars are represented in the game. Maybe some gameplay footage? Some gameplay footage, anybody? Either way, um, I gotta tell you, with all the criticism that I have, I, I come out at the end of this dev diary with the opinion that the work that has been created here on a theoretically uh, theoretical level, and this is important to point out, we don't know how this actually works, whether it works properly or not, but on a theoretical level, this will be impactful to the player, and this feels as though you can either react or sort of step out and... For example, leave a war that overstretched you. You might face rebellions in other regions such as Canada if you accidentally starve them because, you know, in a war your supply network are plundered. This is really interesting stuff that isn't present in any other non-war game. Again, Hearts of Iron 4 has it, but it's Hearts of Iron 4. Control over the seas is mandatory for a win in World War 2. So, really cool stuff. I'm very eager to see what comes in next dev uh, the next week's dev diary. I hope some gameplay footage, but I don't think I'm alone with that. For the moment, I will see you later. Alligator.